So uh, I will introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, so it, it is Dr. Helgi Sigurdsson. He is originally from Iceland, as you noticed. And uh, so he uh, obtained his uh, PhD at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. And uh, now decided to change... Singapore. Ah, Singapore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, no worries. We worked so much in Iceland, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fine. So now he, he decided to change the island, and uh, he, he uh, is working at uh, the University of uh, Southampton as a research fellow. Uh, and the title of the talk is uh, Time Delay Polytonics. I'm not sure that I understand what it is, but uh, uh, you will explain. So the yeah. floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Anton. So it's uh, really nice to be here in Wolverhampton. And, uh, and present the work that we are doing at uh, the University of Southampton, which is uh, in a group of uh, Professor Pavlis Lagodakis, who has uh, uh, really a, a wonderful group of people doing uh, experiments uh, on polaritons and polariton condensation and strong light matter coupling. So, and the title of my talk is Time Delay Polaritonics, uh, because, um, well, as the title says, I want to show that. Uh, apart from uh, what is the conventionally regarded as the interaction between two quantum ensembles, that if you go to a certain limit, you actually have, uh, you have uh, a wave mechanical uh, effect, which is governed by time-delayed coupling. So an action from one oscillator on another oscillator takes some time, uh, real time, to uh, actually propagate and influence the other quantity. So, but before we go into all that, I'll have to introduce... Uh, what is, the, what is the platform that we're working with? So what is the exciton polariton, this particle that uh, we are going to be working with in our in a condensed matter system? So the system in question is a, is a micro cavity, so micro scale mirror cavity, which confines light uh, very, very efficiently, right? So what you, can, what you do is you have some dielectric back mirrors, which allow the transmission of light into the cavity, but this defect-like cavity traps the light, it bounces many, 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 many times back and forth, and then eventually, of course, it, uh, it, it escapes. But having it trapped for long enough is uh, what we are looking after, because when it is trapped long enough, it will interact with uh, any kind of an emitter that we put inside the cavity. So for example, here, we have put a semiconductor quantum well, which is effectively two-dimensional. It's just maybe 10 nanometers in the longitudinal direction. Uh, millimeters in that transverse direction and in this quantum well there are optical resonances and it is the uh, and specifically the one that we're looking at is the exciton resonance which is the bound state of an electron excited from the valence band up to the conduction band and because of the Coulomb interaction it binds with the hole which is left behind in the valence band <coughs> so and how do you describe so in this interaction between the light and the excitons in these systems? Well, you go to a procedure which is well known in, uh, in atomic optics, which is that you regard the exciton as just a two-level system. So you can send in a photon, you can absorb the photon. Sorry, the electron absorbs the photon and jumps up to the conduction band. You have the exciton. And then, and then the cavity photon mode can perturb this exciton to re-emit the photon and then it can reabsorb the same photon, re-emit it and repeat the process many many times and this is possible because the photon is trapped for a very long time inside the cavity. So this is a form of coherent coupling and, and if you write this James Cummings type of Hamiltonian you simply write the modes of the excitons or, sorry not modes, there's only one exciton mode but it's in the momentum basis, the K is a momenta you have the dispersion of the photons and then some constant coupling, uh, coupling value which is uh, usually called the Rapi frequency or the Rapi uh, constant. So, how do the dispersions look like in this cavity system? So the photon dispersion, because it is quant quantized in the longitudinal direction, in the plane of this quantum well, it will take approximately a parabolic dispersion. So we say that the photon inside the plane of the quantum well has an effective mass. And this mass is four to five orders of magnitude smaller than a typical electron mass. So it's a very, very light particle. And because it is so light, 
if you want to plot the parabolic dispersion of the exciton, it looks almost flat because the dispersion of the exciton is just, it's much, much heavier. So you really are working with just these two dispersion branches. And now when they're coupled together through the rapid frequency and you diagonalize your, new, your system, you get new eigenmodes. So this is just uh, the problem in linear algebra where you're solving a, a two by two matrix and you have some off diagonal uh, terms, everything is symmetric and you solve for the new eigenmodes of this matrix and you get uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric eigenvectors. And that's basically these modes. So you have the upper polariton branch, which appears here, and the lower polariton branch, which appears there below. <coughs> and what's important to know is that these polaritons, these new eigenmodes, they are composed of both exciton properties and photon properties. So what this means, so, 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 I'll come to it, uh, what it means uh, in just a second. But, uh, but how it looks like an experiment. So this is just very uh, crude uh, plotting of the, of the dispersion. But if you look at the light coming out of these cavities in the strong coupling regime, you see very clearly these branches belonging to the polariton modes. And you can play around with these branches by simply changing the, the tuning of the photonic mode. So if you tune the photon mode to be very high in energy, you get a very flat dispersion in the lower polariton branch. If you tune it to be very negative, you get this very steep lower polariton branch. Okay. So you can really play around with the system to, get, uh, to engineer your dispersion. And well, this was, uh, I believe it was first formally established that you have this strong coupling in a 1992 paper by uh, Weisbuch and Arkava, which is, uh, which is this one here and published in PRL. This one here, yeah. So, in this picture, it shows, uh, it shows the zero momentum uh, eigen energies. And as you change the cavity to tuning, it's basically you start, let me see, so the tuning is positive here, so you're somewhere in this picture at this end, and then you go to zero detuning, you're somewhere in this picture, and what this measures is basically the distance between the upper and the lower polariton branch. And if you go to very negative detuning, the distance increases again. So this signature is evidence of strong coupling between the two modes in the system. Okay, now what are the characteristics of the polariton? So I said before, it has a very, very light effective mass. It has very high nonlinearities. So typically photonic systems have uh, very weak nonlinearities because they have to rely on the optical properties of the material that you're using. But here we get very high nonlinearities because the excitons, they interact very strongly with each other. So what do I mean when I say nonlinearities? I'm talking about that you have these <coughs> you have interactions between two particles. So two particles can come from, uh, from, uh, from somewhere far apart and they can exchange momenta, they can exchange spin, they can, uh, they can basically interact. And this gives nonlinearities in your equations of motion. So, and then finally, it is very short-lived. Uh, so because uh, you cannot uh, create ideal cavities, the polariton will at some point decay out of the system because the photon escapes. Now, what kind of a, what kind of a state uh, do we want to uh, want we, do we want to realize using the polaritons? Now, if you apply a laser which is non-resonant, and by non-resonant I mean it is tuned very far in energy away from all your uh, from all your modes, so it's somewhere here very high in in energy. If you apply this non-resonant laser and you excite a lot of electrons in your system they will undergo some relaxation through phonon, uh, through phonon interactions because the lattice is kept at uh, typically very low temperatures, eight, six Kelvin, maybe four Kelvin, it depends. Uh, and for those who are curious, the material in question is usually gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide. These are very uh, typical semiconductor materials to get uh, to couple to the exciton resonances. Now, as the electron, hot electrons relax in energy, they approach the point where they start coupling coherently with the light and you start getting polariton formation. And if your intensity, if your particle intensity is high enough, 
they can undergo scattering, stimulated scattering, into a macroscopic coherent state. So, uh, what I am skipping here is a uh, classification of something that's called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And what is a Bose-Einstein condensate? It is, a, it is a phase which appears due to the bosonic statistical nature of, uh, of bosons, such as uh, some integer spin atom called atoms or magnons or even photons themselves and polaritons because they have they have integer spins and this Bose-Einstein condensate is really all the particles occupying the same quantum state in unison so they all occupy the same phase and have all the same properties of this ground state the difference in the polariton system is that this state is not necessarily dictated to be the lowest in energy, it only has to be the one which has the highest gain. And this is what makes polaritons similar to lasers, because lasers activate in a state which has the highest optical gain. Okay, so the message that I'm bringing here is that you have some incoherent ensemble of particles here, and then at a critical intensity, the particles jump down the dispersion and occupy one massive coherent state. And the signature of this is huge coherent emission coming out of uh, the light of the cavity. So this is a very pioneering paper 2006 by the group of uh, uh, Divo and uh, Zidang where they see a sudden build-up of emission in real space. So, it's, uh, so you start with something that's pretty broad in real space and then you pump harder and harder and harder and suddenly you see that the coherent emission becomes huge, it amplifies, it basically jumps in intensity, and you see a massive reduction in your k-space occupation, which means that all the particles are going into the same quantum state. Okay, now the trick with this system is it is strictly non-equilibrium, which means that as soon as you turn off your laser, everything vanishes. Okay, then there is no more. You have to continuously feed power into the system in order to see something like this. So this is what we call a driven dissipative system or a non-equilibrium condensate. Okay, and it, is, uh, it has basically both the properties of a conventional Bose-Einstein condensate but also some of uh, our understanding from just laser theory. Okay, and in this talk I want to discuss what happens when two of these condensates are put close to each other and start interacting with one another. So this is uh, quite a fundamental problem to study because now we can generate these condensates quite easily in these cavities. So it's quite important to know how do they speak to one another. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about nonlinear oscillators and uh, what is the and how things become uh, quickly. Uh, completely intractable, just for those who are maybe not familiar with how how things are in reality. So you just think of a simple harmonic pendulum, very beautiful, very easy, uh, works for small angles and you have uh, you can solve everything quite nicely. Now let's say you do a real pendulum where you now replace, uh, you have not small angles but you have arbitrary angles and then you have to describe this pendulum with the sign of the angle which is uh, oscillating about. It's uh, supposedly written simple pendulum, but it's almost impossible to solve this. Okay. And then if you go to the, the absolutely realistic case, a pendulum with some dampening, like the drag of the air or whatever, which slows it down and makes it converge to its local uh, potential minima, this thing here, you just quit science because this cannot be solved properly at all. Yeah. And it's so, it's so weird because this is, it looks uh, so innocent and easy, but uh, really this is, uh, this is not something you can uh, write a very nice solution to. So really nonlinear oscillators are, are, uh, are a challenge for scientists. Now, as an example, I want to show the uh, Huygens pendulum synchronization. This is a really nice uh, animation. So here you have these uh, uh, these uh, these pendulums, which are all coupled together, so they are coupled to some environment because they have they have uh, they have uh, uh, what's the what's the name for it? 
sorry, sorry, it's escaping my mind. It's uh, not inertia, but uh, this is the awkward part. I know the Icelandic word for it, but I've forgotten the Icelandic word. So they basically they sit on top of this platform, and the response from one oscillator is instantaneously transferred to another oscillator. Because why? Because the force that goes along this platform goes with uh, the speed of uh, speed of sound, right? And the signal propagation is much, much, much faster than the period of this oscillation. So this is a type of a system which you can really regard as not being time delayed, but an instantaneous coupling. Okay, just to give you a reference. So, but why was I talking about oscillators? Now, it turns out that you can regard these condensates as uh, non-linear oscillators. So often uh, we write very discretized form of equations to describe interactions between condensates. And these equations are analogous to non-linear oscillatory equations. So as an example, I want to talk about the uh, trapped cold atom Bose-Einstein condensates, which you can, uh, so what you can do is you can cool your system, and this is an atomic condensate. You get some uh, population, coherent population here, coherent population here, and then they can tunnel through this tiny barrier here between. And what happens is, depending on this, barrier and your initial conditions, you can get coherent oscillations of these particles from one well to the other. So here they are. So here they start all the way over here and now they've transferred all here and then they're transferring back. So this is called a Joseph bosonic Josephson oscillation. Okay. And just as a simple schematic, you're really just analyzing two wave functions coupled across uh, which can tunnel through this barrier and if you write some non-linear Schrodinger equation for it, you can get really rich phase-based dynamics depending on the coupling strength and the initial conditions. You can have states that have very weak uh, oscillations in particle density and phase. You can have states which go through a cyclic orbital uh, behavior in particle density and, and phase. So really, just this uh, simple system shows a lot of rich dynamics. Okay. So this was, uh, this was uh, the quantum uh, version of uh, nonlinear oscillators. So we're going to be using that as a bit of a basis for the next slides. Now, going back to polaritons, because the previous slide was about cold atoms. How do we analyze the interactions between polaritons which are trapped in some potential landscape? Okay, so you have some particles here, particles here, and they can tunnel through a barrier and exchange energy. So usually how we do it is uh, we analyze the problem using something that's called tight binding procedure. Okay. And this procedure relies on that you do not have large phase gradients in your system because you're supposed to be occupying the ground state of your trap, hence the name tight binding. You're deeply trapped in the, in the potential landscape and that the overlap, overlap is relatively small. For polaritons, this can be realized in a number of ways. So one way to trap polaritons is to excite a circular beam. So if you excite, excite with a circular beam, you will get condensation inside the center away from, the, away from your optical beam. And the polaritons are trapped here inside. So you start with some thermal clouds and then they become trapped inside your optical uh, excitation scenario. And another way is to create, this is very tiny, but if you can see it, these are etched micropillars. So this is some uh, electro, uh, uh, electroscope uh, image of, uh, these, uh, of, the, of the cavity. And what you can do is you can really etch uh, structures which confine the photonic mode such that you can play with the polaritons really as just droplets. So they're really localized and they occupy just one state dictated by the boundary conditions of your system. So trapping, uh, poten trapping polaritons no problem at all. And we can use, uh, we can use uh, tight binding procedure to describe the system. Now, because, uh, because we have a mathematician here, I, need to, uh, I wanted to add this slide just to give an idea of what is the equation that we conventionally use to describe these kind of systems. Uh, because uh, just a few equations can be a more illuminating than 30 slides of, with uh, pretty pictures. So how we describe the spatial temporal dynamics is we write some typical, well, we write a Schrodinger equation for the particles traveling in the plane. So this is just the Laplacian 
depending on only the x and the y coordinate. So there is no third dimension, there's no third coordinate. And then we have some potential, which is dictated by uh, some particle reservoirs which do not belong to the condensate. And then we have some nonlinearity here. So notice everything in these equations is linear and nice, except for two points here and here. And this is really the root of the intractability and complexity in these systems, because this makes everything very difficult to solve. And really the only strategy that you can employ, in except for very simple cases, you are only left with the option to numerically integrate everything from some initial condition and another initial condition and see what kind of states that you get. Because uh, the path in state space is completely, uh, you cannot determine it, so you really just have to see what the system spits out for some initial conditions. So, because uh, going from the slide how things become completely unsolvable for these simple oscillators, this is definitely also completely unsolvable. Except in very simple cases, sorry. But could you, could you explain uh, why do you need two, two reservoirs and so how do you distinguish them? Ah, these two reservoirs here. Okay, so one reservoir depends non-linearly on the wave function. Okay, and this corresponds to excitons which can uh, scatter into the condensate, right? They, uh, they satisfy the energy and the momentum conservation principles to, uh, to scatter into the condensate. Okay, but then you can have a background of excitons which are far away from the light cone and are effectively dark, but they're still there in the background somewhere uh, at high momenta in the dispersion, right? And of course, uh, usually we completely neglect this, and in fact, what we do sometimes is that we just wipe away this equation and we add a constant potential term inside this to account for this background of excitons which do not contribute to the to these nonlinear dynamics but it's uh it's uh for me it's more illuminating to write the actual differential equation even though it can be eliminated in most cases yeah okay so like i said tight binding can be uh, applied to to uh, solve these systems and I'm really just going to hop over this because this is really a, a technical uh, part which just illustrates the state of the art in analyzing polaritum condensates deeply trapped. Uh, the point is just that you can get various uh, exotic phases just like the image I showed earlier for the cold atoms and very recent, this is a very nice paper from Hamid Ohati in, Ca in not Cambridge anymore, now I see St. Andrews, where they create a lattice of these trapped condensates and by only increasing the excitation power they they uh, they the the number of particles uh, becomes uh, higher and they lift up a little bit out of the trap and they couple strongly enough to completely synchronize as is shown in this schematic here and this is completely reproduced by just using some stochastic tight binding model so very very nice uh, it tells us that this works now but there is an inverted case, and this is what uh, is going on in Southampton and in Skoltek in Russia right now. We are working with these type of condensates. So what is this? So this is a very, very tightly focused non-resonant laser. And instead of a trap, there is nothing. It's just an uh, open system. You generate a lot of polaritons here, a lot of excitons and a lot of polaritons. And so your system, is really just an open system with one potential peak, which the polaritons appear on, and then they convert their potential energy into kinetic one and flow away from the pump spot. Okay, this is the, this is the unique uh, thing about polaritons because for atoms, cold atoms, you need to have some trap, you need to have some ground state, but here you can create your condensate by just driving the system hard enough. Okay, so really it is like, it is like a laser. but. This is a matter wave which flows away from, the, from your laser beam. And how does it look like an experiment? So this is the real space image. This is a bright spot corresponding to the intensity of this condensate. And in momentum space, we see a very sharp ring. And this ring, the reason you're occupying this ring in momentum space, just means that the polaritons, the wave function, 
has a wave vector going in all directions. It is radially expanding away from this spot. That is the signature of this ring here. Okay. And then if we look at the energy, it occupies a single energy very high. It's very far away from the bottom of the dispersion. It's very high up here. So this is really energetic condensate that you're creating right here. Okay. So now the question comes, how do we describe the interactions between these two, between many energetic condensates? Because now it's no longer clear that you can apply tight binding. So this has been uh, done before. There hasn't really been any uh, proper addressing of this, uh, of this issue, but there have been a lot of experiments on this issue. So uh, this is a work from Jeremy Baumberg in Cambridge where they were doing, uh, where they pumped uh, polaritons with a tight laser. And when they looked at the emission at the pump spots, they saw polaritons occupying almost no momenta. But when they measured the light away from the pump spot, they gained some k-vector. This is exactly what I was saying in the last slide, that you have some potential energy that converts to kinetic energy and everything flows away. And then if you put many pump spots together, you can get really nice uh, interference pattern and uh, phase synchronization between these condensates. And here, this is a really nice work from Pavlos Lagodakis group in Southampton, where they make some analogy of these interacting condensates with non-trivial Hamiltonians, the XY Hamiltonian. Okay. Did this uh, animation play? Let me see. No. Let, did it play? Okay, good. So, now, what is the state of the art of understanding these interacting condensates? So, this is uh, probably best studied by Natalia Berloff, Professor Natalia Berloff in, at the University of Cambridge, and uh, Professor Lankodakis. So there's been now a series of papers. Uh, these are just three, but I think they have now almost eight papers on the interaction between these condensates, where they apply some sort of, uh, some kind of uh, tight binding procedure and uh, try to describe uh, the, the interaction uh, between these two condensates. It's a little bit unclear to me, uh, but, uh, but then in this paper, which came just now here in 2019, they really was, well, this is just uh, Professor Berloff. What she's stressing in this paper is that you can excite many, many condensates, create a huge network, a graph of these condensates. And in different limiting cases of the equations of motion, you can connect this network to many different oscillatory networks, which, uh, for example, there is the Kuramoto model, which is a, a network of uh, pen, rigid pendulums which are coupled together. Sakaguchi Kuramoto model, which is a network of pendulums which are not rigid. Stuart Landau systems, Lankobashi systems, which are used to uh, describe semiconductor lasers. Loads of stuff. But this paper, this is a. Uh, these things uh, are, these are all, uh, let's, let me put it this way. There is not a good justification why you can just take these equations and put some terms to zero and say, ah, we have a connection to this and that and that. You have to have an actual physical system where you can't do any of these procedures and connect to one of these things. Okay, otherwise you're just uh, doing uh, mathematics which might not be reproduced any any laboratory system. Okay, so we want to have something that uh, reproduces our results in our laboratory accurately. And we have been studying for several months what is the best way to describe the system. And it turns out they are best described as time-delayed oscillators. Okay. And time-delayed oscillators are ubiquitous in nature. So you can see them in electronic circuitry with some nonlinear elements. Uh, thermodynamical systems where you just change the distance between two candle flames, you will see them synchronize either in phase or anti phase. Uh, micro, uh, microorganisms where you keep them trapped and allow them to interact through some narrow tube channel. Uh, lasers with feedback, traffic models. Time delay networks are really uh, appear almost everywhere. And as my first front slide suggested, they also appear in uh, uh, neurological models. 
where you describe the synapses of the brains uh, firing and connecting with each other. So let's just uh, take an example. So we, we, were, we were looking earlier on this uh, oscillator network which has an instantaneous response and synchronizes at some point. So what would be the what would be a case uh, of a non-instantaneous -instant response? Well, for example, think of just uh, taking a shower. Okay, so you go into the shower and you will probably make it uh, too hot, right? And then you say, okay, it's too hot, I'm gonna try to lower the temperature a bit. You lower the temperature and you say, okay, this is probably good, but it takes time for the water to reach you and then it's too cold. And you're like, oh no, I have to make it more hot again. And then you keep changing it until you hopefully converge to some very small ideal point, which is the ideal shower temperature. And this is, a de this is a delayed response because it takes time for the water to come from your heater and, and, uh, and uh, give, give you a performance action upon you. So really it's, uh, it's a time delay. Time delay uh, physics are not something uh, which is unfamiliar. So now I want to discuss the actual experiment that we do in Southampton. So, and what evidence do we have? So, the whole point of this is to describe the interactions between these two polariton condensates, these two puddles of coherent light. So let us imagine you have two lasers and you slowly change the distance between these two lasers. What we see in our experiment is that there's a gradual phase, uh, not phase, but a gradual change in the interference fringes between these two uh, condensates. And if there is a fringe, bright fringe in the center, it means that the condensates have locked in phase. So they oscillate together. But if there is a density minimum, a dark fringe in the center, it means they have locked pi out of phase. So, uh, so something like this. And uh, you can look at the K space and you see exactly the same thing. Uh, you see the fringes uh, developing also in K space because there's some envelope to the wave function. But what is very interesting, if you look at the energy space, what energy frequencies these polarities are occupying, you see that the modes of the system are sweeping through, th through some sort of a gain region. So you have polaritons occupying one state and appearing in another, and you gradually go through these modes. So it's like you have a mirror, and you're changing the length of the mirror, and you're changing which modes have the highest optical gain, which modes do the polaritons want to hop into or scatter into. And if you just look at the intensity in these energies, you see that they have a very well, uh, uh, very uh, nice oscillatory change in particle intensities. So really there's something very regular going on in our system. So another thing we can measure is where are these energies, what energy are these bands occupying relative to the bottom of the dispersion? If you plot the value of the frequencies of these polariton intensities, you will see these successive bands appearing. And here, the blue bands correspond to the odd parity or the pi out of phase system, and the red bands to the even parity, which is in phase system. And what is remarkable, that these bands, you can find the same kind of structure in these bands in other time delayed systems. So this is a very nice paper about time delayed electronic circuitry where they show antiphase, in-phase, antiphase, in-phase bands, which even have the same shape as the bands in our experiment. So really we seem to be onto something that there is indeed a time-delayed interaction going on here, which is dictating the synchronization. Now, how do we analyze this problem theoretically? So, what we want to do is to know what are the resonant frequencies, the resonant energies inside the system. So because there are two potentials created by the pumps, it creates some sort of a transmission and reflectance condition. And there will be a set of energies which have the least transmission and remain reflected inside between these potentials for the longest. If you solve these resonances of the system, you you can, uh, you can uh, show that, these, uh, that the k-vectors, the momenta belonging to the resonances inside the system, belong to a function called the Lambert W function. Now, 
this kind of a problem, this is uh, well studied in quantum mechanics. Yeah. So, uh, but usually when you do this problem in quantum mechanics, you write the condition for transmission and reflection, and that's where you stop. But the next step is saying that the plane waves, the resonant plane waves, they, follow, they obey this uh, very uh, odd function here. So I'm not going to go into what is the Lambert W function, but it is an analytical function. It is a transcendental function. Okay. It has many, many solutions. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it does have a complicated form, but it's at least a uh, closed form expression for the, for the resonances in the system. Ah, so uh, what? Uh, so w where do I come to this? Yeah. Okay, so 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 the do I have a pen here somewhere? Uh, the marker. Yeah, a marker. You have to use hand waving. I have to use hand waving. <laughs> okay, so you're solving the you're solving the problem of when there is a, when the transmission mm -hmm. out of the system. Well, you start with some waves. So usually you start with some waves which come at the system. Okay. But here you're just solving the, where the waves appear first inside here. And then you ask yourself, what waves have the least amount of transmission outside of the system? Okay. And that gives you a very uh, simple expression which has a solution dictated by the Lambert W function. So it's an opti optimization of uh, minimization of losses. Yeah, systems. basically. And if you plot the energies of, uh, of these k-vectors, so let's just uh, plot the energies uh, through this uh, kinetic form, you get these bands here. And these bands, the dotted bands, are energies with very big decay. And the solid ones have very low decay. And what this means, these bands would be populated first by particles if you are stimulating the system. And this is exactly what we see in experiment. We see these bands and we can see that these bands are the same in, uh, in just from this very, very, very simple uh, uh, problem. This is a time independent problem. Okay. So already we seem to be on the right path of analyzing the energies in form of this just simple uh, transmission and reflection problem. Now, but what we want to do ideally is to derive some time dependent problem. We want to show the dynamics of the oscillators. But now that we know the resonant energies inside the system, we're going to say the polaritons inside the system can only occupy these resonant energies. And we're going to assume that the system is perfectly symmetric. So you have particles coming from this spot with uh, amplitude C1, here, C1 here and C1 here, and C2 coming from uh, this spot here. So they're flowing in this direction and this direction and the amplitude here determines the outflow. Okay. If you use this kind of an, this kind of a solution and you plug it into the time dependent Schrodinger equation and you utilize the resonant energies inside this equation, you can derive exactly this kind of a Schrodinger equation. So far everything is linear. There is no nonlinearity yet. It's just a linear equation. This term is just some self energy which the polaritons occupy. This term is the interaction of this polariton with this one here. And you can see that there appears this exponential. This is a constant, and there appears this exponential here with KD. Now, what this means is that the coupling of polariton coming from potential 1 to potential 2 is lacking in phase which is uh, the same as the momentum times the distance. So we have a polariton traveling from point 1 to 2, and it rotated as it moved from 1 to 2. So there is a phase lag. Okay. <coughs> and because we know that, uh, that this phase lag is going to depend on the phase velocity of the polaritons, we can connect it directly to the frequency of the polaritons, because phase velocity is just omega divided by k and then you can uh, transform this coupling term into a time delay term. This kappa here, this is just an amplitude uh, uh, proportional to the envelope of the wave function. Right. It makes sense because if the condensates are very far apart, their envelopes are very very small when they hit each other, 
so the coupling is very weak. If they are very close, the envelopes overlap a lot. So that's why you have this real exponential term right here. The main point is you can derive exactly this time delay inside the system. Now, and uh, I've already explained this. So our picture is now the following. You have condensate one and two, they interact with each other uh, through a time delay mechanism. And now this is a bit of a jump, but I wrote these equations earlier. I'm going to write two of them uh, just now here. We're going to introduce the time delay term and the typical reservoir nonlinearities and the polarity and polarity nonlinearities. So these will be the most proper form of the equations to describe the two condensates dynamically. I should stress, it is important to have these nonlinearities if you want to do some uh, spatial temporal simulation, because if you do not have them, your code breaks, everything diverges. So you need to have these nonlinearities to be able to simulate the system really. Okay, now what happens if we simulate this equation? We get this. The red dots are frequencies appearing from the simulation, just initiated from random white noise, and the black color map is the energies that we see in experiment. So truly, there is, a, and this is done with minimal fitting of the parameters. The parameters here are chosen to be very typical uh, in discretized, uh, discretized models describing polarity and condensates. So truly, we think we are on uh, really, really the right path because when we saw this image, we were just, uh, I cannot describe how happy we were because this is like a accumulation of many months of work. <laughs> and just to mention one thing here, this equation, if you neglect this nonlinearity here, it is analogous to the Lankobashi equation. So I was mentioning earlier that there were proposals that these polarity networks, they can be all, all kinds of networks if you just take different limits. But we have here fair and square shown that you truly have a connection to the famous Lankobashi equations, which are time delayed nonlinear uh, oscillator equations, uh, conventionally used to describe uh, lasers with feedback. So this is, um, this is uh, really the accumulation of our work. Now, uh, just a fun little thing. This is just a little pretty animation that I want to show. How much time? Okay. So if you do these kind of special spatial temporal uh, dynamics, you can really see that uh, there are points where you occupy one energy here and one energy here, right? So, you, so your system can occupy two energies at the same time. What happens? Everything becomes non-stationary. And you see a really nice periodic beating between the two uh, condensates, right? And if you look at the phase, you will see this uh, swooping motion in the phase. It's uh, really, uh, really just done. Uh, a result that I want to show because uh, we think this is really happening in our system. The problem is we cannot see these kind of dynamics because these dynamics are happening at 12 picosecond scale. And if I were to say to an experimentalist, can you uh, help me resolve these dynamics which have a period of 12 picoseconds, he will just tell me to go away because you would need some very, very, very state-of-the-art street cameras to see these kind of uh, coherent oscillations. But what the experimentalists can do is see the uh, average. And that's all these black bands here. They really can see the energies in the system. But they cannot resolve the dynamics yet. OK. Now, now we come to a little bit of an interesting uh, tangent. So there was it was proposed recently by a good friend of mine, Tim Liu, and his collaborator, Michal Matsusevsky, Michal Matsusevsky and Timothy Liu, Tim Liu is at the uh, Nanyan Technological University in Singapore, and Michał Matzewski is in uh, Warsaw in Poland. They proposed you can use these polarity and condensate networks for neural computation. So you can uh, design something in the laboratory which you can use as a black box to do very complex, complex signal processing and it spits out an answer, which is the desired answer, which you train it to uh, give. Okay, this principle is based on something that's called echo state networks or liquid state machines. It's really just uh, using a very complicated uh, dynamical system and training it to give you the answer that you want, given some input. 
and they did some uh, some uh, calculations using a continuous input of lasers inside a system of condensates and the lasers took up the form of some numbers so this is the MNIST data where you have a million maybe, maybe not millions but thousands of different handwritings of uh, of some numbers and the point is that given this input the polarity network should tell you you have a zero if you write something that looks like one it should tell you you have a one and these dynamical networks are really efficient because of uh, development and training techniques they become really efficient in in uh, solving these uh, continuous uh, time input problems okay so you see this axis is time so it's like a laser that rises and then drops and this is the information that you're putting into the system so really fascinating and the key point here is that these systems they work even better when they're time delayed so this is what we want to do all of this is done with just conventional networks but what we want to do is to see can we bring our network which has time delay into this picture and create some kind of a <laughs> like Fabrice said uh, yesterday some polariton brain which will hopefully solve all of our problems yeah, because uh, you can use it for uh, probably logistics and uh, uh, economics and uh, for uh, biology looking at protein folding and so on you can you can uh, potentially use these neural networks for so many difficult tasks in reality so I think I am going to just stop here because the next parts are about uh, block band engineering but uh, I think I've really just uh, put all of the powder into this so I'm just gonna skip skip uh, these things here and come to the conclusion and outlook so the conclusion is that we have for the first time shown that coherent matter waves can interact as time delayed oscillators there are some approximations in our theory. We are still addressing to make uh, writing the equations in a most accurate form as possible. But the preliminary results show that there is really good agreement using these time delay equations. And they have always, they have, for in the perspective of condensates, they have never been used before. So this is really something uh, new. And the idea is then, can we then bring this to huge graphs networks of these condensates and create something that can uh, compute very difficult problems and uh, there are loads of other things that we can do we can do band engineering generate vortex currents but uh, i skipped over this so i'll have to uh, skip over it here again and with that i am going to uh, thank my team which is composed of julian topfer uh, lucy pickup and paulus lagatank is really really wonderful people to work with and also, acknowledgements go to Professor Natalia Berl of Kirill Kalinin, Professor Wolfgang Langbein, who designed the sample, or grew the sample, and Professor Janne Rusakowski in Lancaster University, who has uh, very, uh, very interesting discussions with about describing these systems. And here's just a video showing the candle flame oscillators oscillating in phase and anti phase. So, again, time delay networks. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. So the simulator, so, uh, so what is the simulator? The simulator is using these networks to, to uh, somehow heuristically find the ground state of a uh, spin Hamiltonian with random coupling. So something that's very, uh, very difficult to do. This was the initial development in 2016 and we are still looking into it. But, uh, but with this, coming into light, the time delay and the fact that you're occupying many energies at given distances, it really puts a, a, a damper on uh, simulating the, the spin Hamiltonians because the original theory of simulating the spin Hamiltonians relied on that everything would occupy a single frequency. So you wouldn't have some non-stationary uh, oscillations, the phase would be frozen everywhere in the lattice. But now we see you have a lot more than that. You cannot just arbitrarily play with the distances. You will have oscillations everywhere. 
chaos potentially because these time delay networks they are very susceptible to chaos so we are we are thinking about it but right now it's not looking com so positive as it did three years ago so this looks more promising right? well the angle of the neural networks for me it looks more promising because um, okay. in, in the Brighton simulator case there was this uh, this argument where there was some quantum advantage or quantum effect like uh, Engelmann or going beyond classical calculation was this uh, was this in the Nature Materials paper or uh, some other paper from Natalia and Pavlos? But th that's my question actually. I mean, it was never clear for me if the claim that there is quantum advantage or not in the principle of the of the simulator. But since you are saying that now you are moving to something else, I'd like to shift the question as well to this new target. Is there the possibility to bring some quantum advantage in this uh, in this neural network? As for a quantum speed up, I honestly do not know. It's uh, right now everything is done. Uh, I do not think there is a quantum speed up. It's uh, this whole neural network idea is uh, is based on everything being done classically, and so I don't see how I don't quite see how quantum speed up is going to enter. But but the, but anyway, the interactions are on a picosecond time scale. They're very very fast, and you can do a readout after evolving your system for uh, maybe 100 or 200 picoseconds and that's enough for you to do an input and a readout so the whole computation happens on uh, maybe 200 picoseconds yeah, and that's much better than photonic systems I'm sure there are advantages in using light on mm -hmm. at least from some people like Penrose for instance yeah, mm -hmm. argue that maybe there is some quantum effect in the brain mm -hmm. to have consciousness or things like this mm -hmm. it's still very open Mm -hmm. from the side, nobody actually looks at quantum effect, quantum mechanical effect for for neural networks. Yeah, but maybe it's something that Brightons could uh, could try to to investigate because over classical systems with mm -hmm. neural networks, I don't think that Google when they did this machine learning mm -hmm. there's the possibility to bring quantum mechanics into their stuff. Well, it might be something that at least if it was an argument for the Brighton simulator, it might be an, an asset for this. No, it's a you, you're right. For example, the, these uh, projects which are going on on developing some sort of a circ neuro neurologically desired inspired circuitry, which are based on some some uh, elements which have plasticity, such as the memory store. This is an element that came into light just four years ago, I think, for in some Nature paper. It is an element which whose resistance changes with the amount of voltage that pass through it. And with this, they are creating some uh, nonlinear electronic circuitry, which is supposed to mimic uh, neurological behavior. But this is all, but there is nothing quantum in this. And yet, there are millions of dollars being put into this to see what it can do. So, so maybe we have something, uh, some kind of a hidden advantage in these polariton networks. But right now, it is unclear to me if uh, if it is there. Yes. Thank you. It's very enlightened by that. How robust are these systems against thermal effects? So, thermal. So everything is kept at the same temperature. So it's uh, so it's at six uh, around six Kelvin. Oh. So really, you have uh, almost you you really do not have any thermal excitations out of your system. It's uh, really quite uh, quite robust. Okay. Yeah. There is also there is another thing. Uh, there, there, there can be disorder in these systems. So how you design the system, uh, there might be uh, like a, a landscape of little valleys and hills which the particles feel. But this has also been minimized in these samples by using very techniques developed in 2016. And that is the reason why we can see, why we can see, uh, so if I go back here, so just this here, that is the reason why we can see these interference fringes or these huge distances because if there was disorder, this would just wash out and not be discernible. But now we have samples which are really, really uh, good at showing these coherent properties of the condensates. In, in, the, in this proposal of Tim and Michal, yeah. um, so how do they put the, the signal into, like, to, to describe the, the zero that you show up there? So I see there are many numbers. In the input on the, on the left, I see mm -hmm. Q1 through G up to N. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, what is it that you are feeding to the system? Do you have a single photon? 
No, no, not single photons. So what you are feeding into the system, so, uh, how, so how does it work? So let me see. You have some input matrix here, which, uh, uh, which multiplies with this vector which has uh, time-dependent input signals. So what you're doing is that you, are, you have some lasers, resonant lasers, and I don't know how they would do this in experiment. In fact, me and Pavlos have been discussing uh, how, how you're going to make this actually. But really you put a different amount of light on this time axis and a different amount of this axis into maybe one condensate and then different amounts into this condensate. Basically you mix everything together and you put it inside the system. So it's really like some complicated superposition of your time dependent signal into, uh, into different condensate nodes. Uh, these here, Th these are these are the nodes which will support yeah, the condensate. Similar, so you have like these amplitudes u1, u2, in time, and that's yeah, this is the intensity of a resonant it's light coming in. Yeah, on different yeah, sides. and not even necessarily with some w wave vector. I think here they're just thinking about normal incident light at some frequency, which uh, excites, uh, which puts this resonant drive into the equations of motion here and sparks condensation for a long enough time to do some complicated readout. And then on, on which property do you measure the, the digit? Because there you have 10 choices, no? Mm -hmm. so, so how can you measure one of them? So if you have 10 digits, and let's say you have, here we have 5 by 5, so 25 condensates. So what you do is that you take all of them, what they do, they read the light intensity after some time, at each node. And then there is uh, something that is called, uh, there is a training method that is called a logistic regression. And it's really taking the input signal from all of these uh, light nodes and making different superpositions, which you then gather together. And then it's, I assume this is then fed to into some sort of a sigmoid function, which then tells you, you have zero or you have two or you have eight. Okay, so there, there is some kind of sigmoid function at the end. There has to be. It's uh, collect the light from all the, from the yeah. So for example, the sigmoid function it uh, approaches one as you put uh, higher and higher numbers into it, right? So it means that if a certain area lights up, then maybe it gives you one in nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's I think this is the principle. But you can also maybe do something by reading out the face. But this is much more difficult. Uh -huh. uh, I was under impression that uh, calling this uh, interaction the time delay interaction is just a way, uh, a nice way to interpret the uh, inter sort of interpretation. Uh -huh. Because in fact, you express the interaction term in, ter in terms of a tau delay, delay. Yes. Which in turn depends on the separation between the. Yeah, phases. and there is. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yes, so, so, so in fact, from the theory point of view, you can just obtain all the uh, necessary results with uh, solving the time-independent uh, non-Hermitian uh, uh, Schrodinger equation mm -hmm. and just sometimes uh, uh, several eigenstates uh, are present at the same time which explains the beating on this oscillation. Yes, uh, I should point out uh, a very important part that we are really treating the problem perturbatively, right? Because everything here, you see, everything here depends on K, right? And K is changing with what energy you're occupying. So if I want to solve this uh, dynamical equation, I have to substitute some value for this K because uh, I cannot solve it for time and K at the same time, yeah? And this is, so this is like a perturbative treatment. We put in K, which corresponds to the outflow of an isolated condensate. So it's really like perturbative treatment where the first order correction depends on the properties of the unperturbed wave function. And so you put in the, the phase velocity of isolated condensates and then you solve everything in time. Of course, the more, the more complicated picture were to do some sort of a uh, you would have to go to the frequency domain and do some very uh, nasty convolution to get uh, the, um, to solve this interaction term properly. So that's why we're doing things more perturbatively here. Uh, I'm just saying there are 
you can do this, uh, th there is more to the story. But, but just this approximation still gives a very good uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. okay. So if there are no more questions, then we can uh, uh, thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.